is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Hello, friends, and welcome back. Today I'll talk about something that came as a surprise to me, actually. I wasn't intending to talk about this, but a few things came up over the past few days, and I felt that the Lord wanted me to talk about this. And it's actually a topic that I haven't heard spoken of very often, and so I think that it might be very important for you who are listening right now to hear what I'm about to share. Earlier this week, I received an email from a local missionary, and by that I mean a missionary who was sent from one part of his country to another part of his country. So he's a local, but he's been sent from his city up to another place to do ministry. I won't mention the country. And he's been involved in various kinds of ministry up where he's been sent, but he's had some problems with the local church there. And he wrote that he met with the pastor, and here I'll read what um, this missionary said. Even though he formally gave me permission to start a ministry in the church, I am hesitant to do that. I'm pretty discouraged by this conversation. I don't see that he wants anything new in his church. He's just in fear of losing control. So that was part of this update from this local missionary. He's trying to start some work and be involved in ministry. He met with a local pastor, the, the senior pastor of the church that he's attending. And even though the pastor formally gave him permission to be involved in ministry, he's still hesitant because that pastor doesn't really seem to want anything new. He's just in fear of losing control. Well, that made me think of something that John wrote in Third John, that letter that he wrote to Gaius. And that's a little short book. It's just a short letter that he writes to Gaius, who's attending a church. And I want to read what John wrote to Gaius. In verse 9 of Third John, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. <laughs> it's really remarkable to me. Here we are at the foundations of the church age, and John is having this kind of trouble with a senior pastor. So John is writing to Gaius, and he says that he wrote to the church. And boy, I wish I could read that letter. I'd like to see what he wrote to that church. But the pastor, Diotrephes, loves to be first. And that is the key phrase. And it was happening in the first century, and it's happening now. Pastors who love to be first. John says Diotrephes would have nothing to do with him. <laughs> this is the Apostle John, who rested against Jesus great friend of Jesus, walked with Jesus, involved in many miracles. And Diotrephes, this pastor who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with him. John says, if I come there, I'm going to point out what he's doing because he's gossiping maliciously about John. It's remarkable, isn't it? And it says that Diotrephes, who loves to be first, refuses to welcome the brothers. Anyone that John sends to this church, Diotrephes will not welcome and anyone in the church who wants to welcome people from John, Diotrephes will stop those people and will put them out of the church. It's remarkable, isn't it? This kind of arrogance and fear and love of status has been in the church from the very beginning, actually before the beginning of the church. I think the Apostle John would have a pretty good idea of what it is to love to be first because he and his brother were both corrected by Jesus because they wanted to be first. <laughs> so John knows what that is, and he also knows what it is to be a humble leader. Well, this leads me to the text that I'm going to talk about today. And as I said, it's a bit of a surprise to me because I was not expecting to talk about this until a couple of days ago. This particular chapter is rarely spoken on. So I want to go through 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'll take a look at what Peter, and also Jude a little bit later, says about false teachers that are finding their way into the church. 
And again, it is really remarkable that this was such an issue early in the church age, and it continues to be a very important issue now. And we need to be wise and mindful because there are false teachers. So I'll start working through 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'll read and make comments. If you're in a place where you can have a Bible in front of you, that'd be good just to follow along, because I will go through the chapter, and it's good to refer to the text as I'm talking about it. Just before the beginning of chapter 2, Peter is talking about prophets, the word of the prophets that were made more certain, and prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but spoke from God as they were carried along, these prophets, carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 1 of chapter 2, Peter says, But there were false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories that they've made up, Their condemnation has been long hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. We'll stop there, and I'll point out a few things that Peter said here. He says there were false prophets, and there will be false teachers. And one mark of these false teachers is that they secretly introduce destructive heresies. Um, Heresy is just a false teaching, something that goes against the revealed will of God. And they'll do this even to the point of denying the lordship of Jesus, who actually brought them into the position they're in. They will even deny the sovereign Lord. And in doing so, they are setting up destruction for themselves. Remember what Jesus said. This is in Matthew chapter 18. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. People who cause followers of Jesus to sin by secretly introducing false teachings and denying the sovereignty of God, their destruction is coming. And it really would be better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck and be thrown into the ocean. So that destruction is coming. we got to remember that. Verse 2, it says, many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the truth into disrepute. I've mentioned a few times that I hope to do a teaching called the ifs of Jesus. And I also want to do one called the many's of the scriptures. Many people will follow their shameful ways. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles, and then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Those are the words of Jesus. Many will say that to him on that day, and many are going to follow the shameful ways of these false teachers. Probably the same group. There's going to be a lot of overlap. The people that follow these false teachers are the ones that will say, hey, we were churchgoers, and we did all kinds of things in your name. And Jesus will say, I did not know you. Peter says that by doing this, these church people, I have quotes there, are going to bring the way of truth into disrepute, which of course makes sense if the world is watching the church follow the ways of the world, well, then people who are not Christians would say, what's the difference between us and them? And will undermine the absolute truth of the teachings of Jesus. And in verse 3, Peter says that these teachers are greedy and they exploit people with stories that they've made up. I have to say that I've seen a lot of that happen. Teachers that are obviously greedy for money or for power, for fame, but many times for money, they exploit people with things that they just made up. We've got to watch out for that. Greedy people who take positions of authority and then secretly introduce false teachings, and then exploit people to get their money from them so that they can fulfill their greed. Peter says that their condemnation is hanging over them, and their destruction is coming. 
In the next section, Paul talks about this, this destruction that is coming. I won't read it, but I'll talk about it. The basic idea for the next several verses, verses 4 through 10, is God did not spare angels when they sinned. He did not spare the ancient world in the times of Noah. And he did not spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for their sin. And God protected Noah and he protected Lot. And God knows how to rescue godly people from difficulties and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. God knows how to protect righteous people, and he knows how to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. He is not going to spare these false teachers. Even though they may seem to be succeeding now, he is not going to spare them. And he knows how to rescue you and me if we will walk in righteousness and abide in him and love him more even than the fame or the wealth of these arrogant teachers. In verse 10, Peter says, it's especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. Interesting marker of these false teachers is they actually are following the broken, filthy desire of their sinful nature, and they despise authority. Well, what is it to despise authority? Well, I think in one case, they're saying that Jesus is Lord, and yet they don't do what he says. They're doing the opposite of what he says, and they show that they despise authority in that. And Peter says they're bold, and they're arrogant, and they're not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, though they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. We find a parallel of that in Jude, in verse 9 of his letter, says, Even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, boy, I'd like to know more about that. (laughs) Even the archangel Michael did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against the devil, But the archangel Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. And Jude says, yet these men, these false teachers, they speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. We need to be careful about that, don't we? I was talking to a friend of mine in Austin a long time ago. He was driving down the interstate, heading from the north to the south. And those of you who know Austin, at one point you come up over a rise in the hill And as you're coming down on the highway, you can see all of downtown open up before you there. And as he was coming up over that rise and looking over the city, he started praying against the demons of the city and rebuking the devil and speaking forcefully against things that he really didn't understand. And he said that he felt like somebody hit him on the back of the head with a board, a very solid, hard hit right on the back of his head bang, as he was praying. And it hurt him so much that he had to pull over and stop. And it was a spiritual attack. He told me that he was praying against these forces that he he didn't understand their power. And he was rebuking them himself instead of saying, the Lord rebuke you. He was trying to fight them himself, and they were tough. If the archangel Michael is not even going to rebuke the devil, but say, the Lord rebuke you, we need to be careful about that too. Continuing on in verse 13 of 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter says that these false teachers will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. Their eyes are full of adultery. They never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. So I've highlighted a few things here in the text. These false teachers pursue pleasure. They carouse in broad daylight. They're not even ashamed to hide their sin. Carousing in broad daylight. So here are the things. Their eyes are full of adultery. They seduce the unstable. My goodness, I've seen that. They're experts in greed. They love the wages of wickedness. Going on in verse 17, it says, These teachers, these men, are springs without water, mists driven by a storm. The blackest darkness is reserved for them because they mouth empty, boastful words. 
and by appealing to the lustful desires of human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. These false teachers, in verse 19, they promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. Brothers and sisters, we live in a time when there are many false teachers, and I dare say that technology has allowed these false teachers to have an even more magnified presence and influence. And there are a lot of people, sadly, very sadly, who are unstable, and they get pulled away by these false teachers. They're seduced by the promises of these false teachers. I will put in this category those who teach the prosperity gospel, health and wealth. They seduce people with these lies. They draw a tremendous amount of money to themselves and influence, have international ministries. But it also goes down to the local level, like my friend, the missionary, whose local pastor was living in fear of losing his control, or like Diotrephes in the first century, he loved to be first. It reminds me of Second Timothy, a very familiar scripture in chapter 4, starting in verse 3. Paul says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Well, Paul said the time is going to come when people don't put up with true teaching and instead, to suit their own desires, they gather teachers around him who say what they want to hear. Well, that time's here. That time is now. A mainline denomination in the United States is going through a break right now because the bishops and other leaders in the church are teaching things that are not true. They are not putting up with sound doctrine, and instead, to suit their own desires and in order to conform to the world's standards, they are saying things that they want to hear. They're believing things that are not true. I dare say it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and to be thrown into the sea than to keep doing what they're doing, which is teaching false doctrine and causing some of those who believe in Jesus to sin, to actually embrace something that is not of the Lord. It's a caution to me because here I am speaking to you, hoping to present the truth of the Lord. And it would be terrible, terrible, terrible if I were to do this in a greedy way or a way to seduce you (laughs) or to love the wages of wickedness. No, I take it to heart what Paul says to Timothy. Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, discharge all the duties of your ministry. And I say that to you as well. Keep your head. Don't just follow these teachers who say things that sound good. Judge it. Judge it by the word of God. And this is not a new problem. This is something that's been going on since the foundation of the church age. It's the wheat and the weeds all growing up together. Remember the parable, a sower sows a field of wheat, and then the enemy comes in and throws in there the tares, the weeds, and then the employees say, hey, we should go pull up all those weeds. And the farmer says, no, don't pull them up. You just need to let it all grow, because when you pull up the bad stuff, you may pull up the good stuff too. So let it come to harvest time, and then we're going to separate these things out. Well, that's happening in churches right now. We need to be very mindful, and we need to stand our ground. Starting in verse 20, Peter says something that is echoed in other parts of the New Testament. If these false teachers have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it, and by it he means the corruption of the world. If they're again entangled in this corruption of the world and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Verse 21, It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. 
verse 22. Of them the Proverbs are true, and here's the quote, a dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. Now, isn't this something? That it's possible to escape the corruption of the world by knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then to become entangled in the corruption of the world and to become overcome by this corruption. And if that happens, a person is worse off than they were at the very beginning. Well, this brings to mind what is written in Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 4. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of this coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Because to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Well, people think about that scripture in many different ways, but pretty clearly it's saying that there is a possibility that if we have come to faith and if we know Jesus and if we know the Holy Spirit and we understand the power and then we turn away, that there's not a second chance after that. And I think what Peter is saying is, you can become entangled in the corruption of the world and then overcome. And if someone is overcome, then they're just worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Well, brothers and sisters, let us be humble and realize that there is a great danger. Our enemy, the devil, is out there. He's roaming around and he's looking. Who can he consume? And we shouldn't be following teachers who tell us what we want to hear. We need to follow the way, with a capital W, the way. Jesus is the way. False teachers will say empty and bragging words, and they will appeal to the lustful desires of our sinful human nature. That's a big part of the health and wealth gospel. This appeal to our sinful desire to be young and beautiful and wealthy and ageless and to live a life free from trouble. And somehow God owes us a simple life, an easy life here in this world. And he doesn't owe us that. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We are going to have trouble and things are going to be hard. But that's okay because he has overcome this world. Peter is saying people can become entangled in this world and overcome And Jesus says that he has overcome the world instead of the world overcoming us. Well, I want to close with what Jude said about these false teachers. These men, these false teachers, are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times, there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing that's stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all.